mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not a choice, it's a way of life. That was the tagline to a commercial that I saw, and I have no idea what the commercial was selling. Don't remember it at all. But that probably, even if I were to meet whoever wrote that tagline to that commercial, it probably wouldn't bother that person all that much because that sort of a tagline, it's not a choice, it's a way of life, is a part of a style of advertising called lifestyle <laughs> advertising. These are the advertisements where they don't really tell you anything about their product exactly. They just imply that if you buy their product, this is the kind of life that you will have. So if you buy one kind of SUV, then you're guaranteed to be a good-looking young urbanite who will happily go from party to party with other good-looking young urbanites. Interestingly enough, if you buy a different SUV, you will be a family who has these amazing vacations and amazing destinations. And all you have to do to get that life is buy that vehicle, right? And the same goes for what beverages you drink, and the same goes for what clothes that you wear, and the same goes for what financial investment firm you choose to go with. All of these things are the way that you get the life that you want, because what they want you to believe is that it's not a choice, but it's a way of life. That's the idea here with this lifestyle advertising. In a way, that's what God was presenting before his people of Israel when we pick up in Deuteronomy chapter 30, the verses that we read today. To give just a little bit of background before we get into God's pitch here, you remember that the people of Israel, they were slaves in Egypt for generations, 400 years of slavery. And then miraculously, God had brought them out of Egypt, first with all of the plagues, and then the miracle of the Passover, and the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea, and they'd gone into the wilderness. And then they had failed to obey God, and for 40 years they had had to wander in the wilderness. And yet in his patience and love he had provided for them manna from heaven, quail, for they would have, so that they would have meat. He had provided for their needs for all of these years, and that's now coming to an end. They're about to finally enter into the land that had been promised centuries ago to Abraham, their forefather. They're about to enter, and God is making sure that they're sure that he has given them his law, his instructions, his directions. And we pick up in verse 15. This is Moses speaking on behalf of God to the people of Israel. And he says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Did I miss something? Is that a difficult choice? <laughs> life and good, death and evil. Behind door number one, life and good. Behind door number two, death and evil. Which door is everybody going to pick? Life and good. Nobody in their right mind is possibly going to pick door number two for death and for evil. This is as simple a decision as there could possibly be. But the stakes are as high as they could possibly be. If I were to paint a 10 inch wide line, in fact, you can even take a look as a little mental thing because these little parquet squares are about five inches each. So imagine a line of two of these squares. If I were to paint a 10 inch line and ask you, could you walk along that line without assistance? Sure. I mean, unless you require assistance for walking in general, a 10 inch wide line is plenty of room for walking relatively easily and cer certainly safely. Now, what if that 10 inch wide line was a 10-inch wide steel girder 500 feet in the air as someone's building a skyscraper. How many of you still feel, even if it's a perfectly still day, how many of you still feel confident that you could walk that successfully? The task is the same. Stay on a 10-inch wide line. But the stakes got raised quite a bit. And that's going to mess with your brain a little. That's going to make it harder to do. Even if you have no problem with heights, 500 feet up is going to get your full attention, right? The, the choice between life and good, death and evil, was as simple a choice as they could possibly be given. By the way, I should point out, it's also a very gracious choice. Because after how many times they have rejected God and his instructions, he would have been fully justified in presenting before them only the option of death 
Because rejecting God's law is always supposed to yield death. That had been a promise all the way back from the Garden of Eden, and nothing has changed ever since then. To reject God's law was supposed to mean death. So he's offering them a choice, and that in and of itself is an act of grace. A choice that, could, that is as simple as a choice could be, even though the stakes are quite high. A choice between life and good, death and evil. That's the choice that God was offering to those Israelites. But he wants to make sure that they really understand the choice that they're making. And so he goes on to explain what the two options are and what they would entail. Starting with verse 16, he says, If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, skipping over a little bit, comes the promise, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. That clearly is door number one. That clearly is the option of choosing life and good. So what does that entail? What does that mean? How do you do that? Well, fortunately, Moses described that for the people. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, and here are the three things that he says that would entail. First, by loving the Lord your God. Second, by walking in his ways. Third, by keeping his commandments, statutes, and rules. Let's take a look briefly at each of those three. For starters, loving the Lord your God. The, the obedience that God wants can't be done outside of love for God. How many of you have ever been as a parent or an instructor of any kind, a teacher, even a boss or su supervisor, you've given someone an instruction and they do it with the maximum amount of grumbling and kicking the ground and saying they think it's a dumb instruction and they shouldn't have to do it at all. When they do that, do you feel like you've been obeyed? I feel like obedience to you when they make it plain that they really, really don't think they should have to do this and they'd really rather not, but okay, whatever. That's not what God wants from his people the same way it's not what we want from our people. The first step of obedience starts with that, make us a little bit uneasy perhaps in our Lutheran theology, but it's true. It starts with our relationship that we have with God, that he is our loving father and we are his children. It starts with love. Obedience that doesn't have love is not God-honoring obedience. And he wants the Israelites to know that. So it starts with loving the Lord, your God. Makes sense that when Jesus was asked to summarize the law, the first half he gave, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That was God's command. You can't keep his law without love for him. Now that love we know in the New Testament is based on the incredible demonstration he's given of his love for us, we're really just reflecting back to him what he has already given. He's the source, we're the reflection. Now that's the first step, loving the Lord your God. The second step that Moses wants to make sure the Israelites know here is that we walk in his ways. Now that is not a one-step process. I could not, nobody could say, went for a walk, right? One step is not a walk. Walking requires right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, and continuing on in that path. Walking in his ways is part of what they're supposed to do. This is not just a choice, it's a way of life. It's not just a one-time thing, it's an every moment of every day kind of thing that God is expecting. That can only come from love. It can only be sustained by love. So loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways. As you love the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then of course it stands to reason you also will be keeping his commandments and statutes and rules. Especially when we remember that those rules are not just rules so that God would have a reason to punish us if we break them, but they're directions. They're instructions. I've used the example before, but if you design something and then you leave a set of instructions on how to use it, that's not you being mean, that's you being helpful. That's you helping people to understand who come after you how this thing that you've designed is supposed to work. When you open the fuel door on your car and it says use unleaded fuel only, that is not small-minded on the part of the engineers. They're just warning you, milk is not gonna work in here. <laughs> Orange juice is not gonna cut it. Water will not make this thing go. Unleaded fuel, please. That's a, that's a direction. It could seem small-minded. It's just the way it works. And that's what God is giving to his people. And even through them still to this day, to us, instructions, directions to understand how this life that he has created and that he sustains, how it works. 
So that's door number one. That's option A. That's life and good, to obey the commandments of the Lord, loving Him, walking in His ways, keeping His commandments. And He promises that you shall live and multiply. The Lord your God will bless you in the land you're entering to take possession of. But He also wants to make sure that they're clear on what's behind door number two. And what would that look like? What's the opposite of the instruction that He just gave? The opposite is this. If your heart turns away, this is verse 17, you will not hear but are drawn away to worship other gods and to serve them. If that happens, then I declare to you today you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and to possess. It makes sense that if the way that we obey is to love the Lord and to walk in His ways and keep His commands, statutes, and rules, then the opposite of that is to have our hearts turn away from God. Certainly the opposite of love. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is some simple disregard, apathy. That's what's described here. If your heart turns away, and you will not hear those commands, statutes, and rules, you will not listen to His directions, then the end result is that you'll be drawn away to worship other gods and to serve them. If we turn from God, what are we turning towards? We're turning toward anything else that's not God. Turn away from the one true God, and what have we turned towards? We've turned towards idols. No matter what they are, whether it's a statue on a shelf or a desire in our heart, turn away from God, and you have turned towards false gods. And God is making plain, since He is the God of life, if you turn away from the God of life, then what have you turned towards? Towards death. Turn away from me, the one who gives life, the one who sustains life. And what will be the result? You shall surely perish. This was God's warning back in the Garden of Eden. This is God's warning through Moses to the Israelites. This was God's warning through Christ to all who heard him. And then through Paul who all would, to all who would listen to the teaching about Christ who has come. When we turn towards God, he is the God of life. When we turn away, there can be nothing but death. That's the warning. Here's some good news. God is not a disinterested party in what decision will be made by the Israelites on that day. And truly not just on that day, because remember, it's not just a choice, it's a way of life. God is pulling for them. God is on their side. He wants them to make the right decision. God is not up there saying, well, here's your decision. Good in life, death and evil, take your pick, doesn't matter to me. Instead, he longs for them to live. Through Moses, we read, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness to you today. It says against you today, but you have to understand the way against was used in, uh, in Hebrew. Uh, witnesses were always used as being witnesses against something. So we would probably translate it as witnessing to something. It's what they've seen and it's what they know. So it's not saying they're calling to testify toward their condemnation, just to testify what, what has been said. I call heaven and earth to witness against you or for you or to you. Use the preposition you like best there. Today, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. That's what God wants from his people. Choose life, that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him. For he is your life, your length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the, swore, that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. To give them. That's what God longs for, that they would make the right choice, and then that they would stick with it. We read in our gospel passage the foolishness of deciding to build a tower, but not seeing if you can afford to do it. That's going to end in folly. Or deciding to start a battle without seeing if you have a sufficient army for that battle. There will be great cost to the life that God has called you to live. Now, you will not be earning that life through the cost. That earn, that is a gift. Christ has given you the new life. That's what we covered all through the summer with, with Colossians and the passages to the Hebrews and all. That the life that we have in Christ, He has given freely and fully. We can't earn that. But as we try to live it out now, well, let me just ask you, is that easy? Can you do that with no investment? Can you do it with no cost to yourself or to your desires or to your relationships or to the outcomes that you might have wanted? Not possible at all. The life of discipleship is, in fact, a costly one. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a name you may be familiar with. He was a Lutheran theologian in Germany in the lead-up to World War II. Actually died in a concentration camp because of his opposition to uh, Hitler and, uh, and the Nazis. He wrote this uh, before.
before he went into prison about discipleship, and specifically in regards to grace. He talked about cheap grace versus costly grace. Cheap grace being that which costs us nothing and which we offer to ourselves. Costly grace being that which Christ offers through the cross. He wrote this. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, but it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs you your life, but it's grace because it gives you the only true life in return. It's costly because it condemns sin, but it's grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. But above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Because costly grace is the incarnation of God. The Israelites faced a choice that day. Thanks be to God, Christ has made that choice on our behalf. Faced with door number one or door number two, life and good, death and evil, which one did he willingly embrace? He did what none of us would do. He took door number two. He was willing to die. He was willing to bear the weight of all the evil of the world so that door number one would be left freely open for us. We may have to struggle to go through it, and living out that life that he has granted by his death may be costly, will be costly. But thanks be to God, it's open to us. Death is not the only option any longer. Instead, in Christ, we have been given a new life. That's not a choice. That's a way of life. But thankfully, it's not just any way of life. It is the way of life eternal. The way that Christ himself has opened up for you, the way that by his grace, by his spirit, you will be equipped to walk each and every day, no matter how costly it may be. And so I encourage you, just as Moses encouraged the Israelites, choose life that you and your offspring might live. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land the Lord swore to your fathers to give. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly in your faith, costly though it may be, in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.